In Jesus' name, anoint my mouth, anoint my mind, let me speak your mind and your wisdom to your people. In Jesus' name, amen. Uh, you may wonder about the order of these questions. Let me put your mind at ease. There is no order. This is the order I got them in, and so this is the order I'm going to use them in. First question. Why in Genesis 17:17 17, 17, did Abraham act with such apparent surprise, skepticism, and disbelief when God promised he would have a child at 100 years old when his own father was 130 years old when he was born? That's a good question. First of all, the dates concerning the birth of Abraham, Haran's, uh, in her, uh, uh, are shaky in that the Septuagint puts it that he was born at 70 years of old and not 130. The Septuagint, thank you is a translation of the Bible which Jesus used, incidentally. It was done by 70 scholars in 70 days, and so it bears the number 70, LXX. If you are ever looking it up, you'll find it, uh, an online version of it, very easy to come by. And the dates there are more in line with the fact that this would be a surprise to Abraham. However, I suggest that the question itself is flawed, and I'll show you why. Take your Bibles, turn to Romans chapter 4, verse 22. Such apparent surprise, skepticism, and disbelief. Romans 4, 22. As it is written... I have made you the father of many nations. By the way, that is the actual translation of his name, father of many nations. He is our father in the sight of God in whom we believe. The God who gives life to the dead and calls the things that are not as though they are. Against all hope, Abraham in hope believed and so became the father of many nations, just as it said to him, so shall your offspring be. Without weakening in his faith, he faced the fact that his body was as good as dead since he was about a hundred years old and Sarah's womb was also dead. Yet he did not waver through unbelief regarding the promise of God, but was strengthened in his faith and gave glory to God, being fully persuaded that God had the power to do what he had promised that's why it was credited to him as righteousness. Yet, he did not waver through unbelief regarding the promise of God. So right there, we knock off the fact that he supposedly was in disbelief. Apparent surprise and skepticism and disbelief. No, according to our Bible, he was not in disbelief at all. He was very much in belief, and as a matter of fact, he didn't even waver into disbelief. Turn to Genesis chapter 17, verse 15. Genesis 17, 15. God also said to Abraham, as for your wife Sarai, you will no longer call her Sarai, which means princess. Her name will be Sarah, which means noble woman. Some translate it queen. I will bless her and will surely give her a son. I will bless her so that she will be the mother of nations. Kings and peoples will come from her. Abram fell face down and he laughed to himself. And he said, will a son be born to a man 100 years old? Will Sarah bear a child at age 90? And Abraham said to God, if only Ishmael might live before you and your blessing. Then God said, yes, but your wife Sarah will bear a son and you shall call him Isaac. 
And I will establish my covenant with him as an everlasting covenant for his descendants after him. As for Ishmael, I have heard you and I will surely bless him and make him fruitful and greatly increase his numbers. He will be the father of 12 rulers, which by the way, turn out to be the 12 princes of Islam. And I will make him into a great nation. But my covenant I will establish with Isaac, whom Sarah will bear to you at this time next year. And what happens here? Abraham hears this and he begins to laugh. Now people suggest, well, this was a, a laugh of disbelief. This was a laugh of, well, you know, that's just stupid, God. Well, it's, it, it wasn't stupid. God would do what God said God would do. And God did do it. I, I had an uncle. And uh, for some time, his wife was away. I believe in New Zealand. Or out in eastern Canada. Might have been eastern Canada. And I remember the day she arrived here uh, and we drove him to the airport and the moment he saw her he just began to roar laughing now it was not that he was laughing at her he was just so delighted laughter came to him and you know what God said you're going to have a son and you're going to name him laughter that's what Isaac means laughter well, if there was anybody that doubted, it might have been his wife. Take your Bibles, turn to Genesis chapter 18, verse 15. Genesis 18, 15. Abraham absolutely did not doubt. Absolutely, he was surprised and thrilled, delighted with the edict of God. Genesis 18, verse 1. The Lord appeared to Abraham at the great, uh, near the great trees of Mamre while they were still sitting at the entrance to his tent in the heat of the day. And Abraham looked up and saw three men standing nearby. When he saw them, he hurried to the entrance of the tent to meet, uh, meet them and bowed low to the ground. And he said, If I have found favor in your eyes, my Lord, do not pass but your servant by. Let a little water be bought, and then you may wash your feet and rest under the tree. Let me get you something to eat so that you can refresh yourselves and go on your way now that you've come to your servant. Very well, they answered. Do as you say. By the way, there were no truck stops in the desert. And so this was ancient hospitality. If somebody came to your door, you looked after them with your life. So Abraham hurried to the tent to Sarah and said, Quick, he said, get three seeds of flour and knead it and bake some bread. And then he ran into the herd and selected a choice and tender calf and gave it to a servant who hurried to prepare it. And then he bought some of the curds and the milk of, and, the, uh, and, and the calf that had been prepared and set it before them. And they ate and they stood near under the tree. Where is your wife, Sarah? They asked. They're in the tent, he said. And the Lord said, I will surely return to you about this time next year. And Sarah, your wife, will have a son. Now, Sarah was listening to, at the entrance of the tent, which was behind him. And Abraham said to Sarah, Abraham and Sarah were already well old and advanced in years. And Sarah was past the age of childbearing. One of the things we do not know about women in this time is exactly how many years they were fertile for. We know that lifespans had changed. We know that prior to the flood, people were living nearly a thousand years. After the flood, the lifespans had been shortened, 300, 200, 100, and were getting shorter and shorter and shorter. We don't know about the fertility of women at this stage. Abraham was old, but his wife made it very clear she was beyond childbearing years. Now watch. So Sarah laughed to herself and she said, and thought, after I'm worn out and my master is old, am I now going to have this pleasure? And then the Lord said to Abraham, 
Why did Sarah laugh and say, will I really have a child now that I'm old? Is anything too hard for the Lord? I'll return to you at the appointed time next year, and Sarah will have a son. And Sarah was afraid, so she lied and said, I didn't laugh. But he said, yes, you did laugh. So the one that showed doubt was Sarah, not Abraham. And incidentally, it had been 25 years since God had first told Abraham he was going to have a son. And Abraham had waited patiently. And then finally, when the time came, they named the boy Laughter. Isaac. Laughter. If you want to see, incidentally, one that did have doubt, one that did resist, one that did turn negative, you look to Zechariah. Take your Bibles, turn to Luke chapter 1, verse 8. Once when Zechariah's division was on duty, he was serving in the, as a priest before God, and he was chosen by lot according to the custom of the priesthood to go into the temple of the Lord and to burn incense. And when the time came for the burning of incense, all the assembled worshipers were praying outside, and then the angel of the Lord appeared to him, or an angel of the Lord appeared to him, standing at the right side of the altar. And when Zechariah saw him, he was startled and gripped with fear. But the angel said to him, Do not be afraid, Zechariah, your prayers have been heard. Your wife Elizabeth will bear a son, and you'll give him the name Johanan, or John. Jump down to verse 18. Zechariah asked the angel, how, uh, can, how can I be sure of this? I'm an old man, and my wife is well along in years. And the angel answered, I'm Gabriel. And I stand in the presence of God. And I have been sent to speak to you and to tell you the good news. And now you'll be silent and not able to speak until it happens. Because you did not believe my words. There is one that rejected the promise of God and was punished for it. Abraham did not show disrespect, disbelief. He did show surprise and joy, and out of that joy bubbled up laughter. And therefore, when the boy came along, he was named Laughter. Second question. What is the meaning and the significance of Exodus chapter 4, 22 to 26. Take your Bibles, turn to Exodus chapter 4, 22 to 26. We'll read it. This is what, then say to Pharaoh, this is what the Lord says. Israel is my firstborn son, and I told you, let my son go so that he may worship me. But if you refuse to let him go, I will kill your firstborn son. At the lodging place on the way, the Lord met Moses and was about to kill him. But Sipporah took a flint knife, cut off her son's foreskin, and touched it to Moses' feet with it, touched Moses' feet with it, and said, Surely you're a bridegroom of blood to me, she said. So the Lord let him alone. At that time, she said, bridegroom of blood, referring to the circumcision. So what's going on here? Well, I'm going to ignore 22 and 23, where Moses is speaking to Pharaoh and warning him that if he doesn't let the children of Israel go, he will, in fact, kill his firstborn. And that is exactly what happens in the final plague. It's called Passover now. But let's look at verse 24. At the lodging place on the way, the Lord met Moses and was about to kill him. Now, we know Moses is going to play one of the most significant roles in the Old Testament. He is going to be huge in the Old Testament. The giver of the law, the first 
five books of the Bible will be written by him. So why would God meet him and be about to kill him? Well, to find that answer, let's go back to Genesis chapter 17, verse 9. Genesis 17, 9. Remember now that Moses has grown up in Pharaoh's court. He dresses Egyptian. He speaks Egyptian. He looks Egyptian. Genesis 17, verse 9. Then God said to Abraham, another major figure in the Old Testament, as for you, you must keep my covenant you and your descendants after you for generations to come. This is the covenant. Uh, uh, this is my covenant with you and your descendants after you, the covenant that you must keep. Every male among you shall be circumcised. You are to undergo circumcision. It will be the sign of the covenant between me and you. For the generations to come, every male among you who is eight days old must be circumcised including those born in your household or bought with money from a foreigner, those who are not your offspring, whether born in your household or bought with your money, they must be circumcised. My covenant in your flesh is to be an everlasting covenant. Any uncircumcised male who has, been, has not been circumcised in the flesh will be cut off from his people. He has broken my covenant. So what is going on in our passage back here in Exodus chapter 4? Moses meets up with his wife. God says to him, I'm going to kill you. And Moses immediately understands and realizes they have not circumcised the boy. And God is about to take it out on Moses. So with a flint knife, Sapura means little sparrow, circumcises the boy and brings the foreskin, the evidence, and lays it at his feet, at Moses' feet, and says, you are a bridegroom of blood to me. I imagine listening to the boy scream, it was not a pleasant situation for her. But let's explain a little bit about what's going on further. Take your Bibles, turn to Exodus chapter 2, verse 16. Exodus 2, 16. Some of the men looking uncomfortable. Cheer up. Circumcision is now of the heart and not of the flesh. And no, you don't have to go and have a little surgery done to be a Christian. Exodus 2.16. Now a priest of Midian had seven daughters, and they came to draw water and fill the troughs to water, uh, 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 and fill the troughs to water their father's flock. Some shepherds came along and drove them away, but Moses got up and came to their rescue and watered their flock. When the girls returned to Raoul, their father, he asked them, why have you returned so early today? And they answered, an Egyptian rescued us from the shepherds. He even drew water for us and watered our flock. And where is he? He asked, asked the daughters. He asked his daughters, pardon me. Why did you leave him? Invite him to have something to eat. And Moses agreed to stay with the man who gave him his daughter Zipporah to, to Moses in marriage. And Zipporah gave birth to a son and Moses named him Gershon, saying, I have become an alien in a foreign land. What is going on? Well, Midian is Saudi Arabia. Zipporah is a Saudi Arabian. She is not familiar with the customs that were taking place in Israel. She is not familiar with Abraham's covenant with the Lord. 
And so when God confronts Moses and says, I'm going to kill you. He turns to his wife and said, the problem here is that we have not circumcised our boy. And she goes off and she circumcises the boy. But remember, she comes from a completely different culture. She has no idea what this is about. And when she brings the foreskin to him, she is disgusted and says, you are a bridegroom of blood to me. That's what that happy little passage is about. Question number three. Why does lamentation separate the major prophets of the Old Testament, Isaiah, Jeremiah, Ezekiel, and Daniel? Well, start with, it doesn't. In the Hebrew Old Testament, it's actually right next to Ruth. In a section of the Hebrew Bible called the Writings, it is connected in our Old Testament next to the book of Jeremiah because it is believed that Jeremiah was the author of Lamentations. Lamentations is a book of five separate poems. The first poem is an acrostic and every line in Hebrew starts with a different letter, Aleph, Beth, and so on, all the way through, if you will, in English, from A to Z. It starts like this. How deserted lies the city, once so full of people. How like a widow is she, who once was great among the nations. She was a queen among the provinces and has now become a slave. Bitterly she weeps at night, tears upon her cheeks. Among all her lovers, there is none to comfort her. All her friends have betrayed her. They have become her enemies. What you see here is Jeremiah given a vision of the destruction of Israel in 586 BC. Imagine if God showed you the destruction of Vancouver or Surrey. Absolute, complete devastation and destruction. And you saw people unable to get their medications, unable to get their food, unable to travel the roads because they've been destroyed. Could you imagine the state of depression you'd be in? And that's why Jeremiah was called the weeping prophet. Lamentations is put in our English Bible where it's put simply because it is believed that Jeremiah wrote it. So it falls right after Jeremiah. Next question. Why was Daniel picked for all the visions of the future? Well, somebody's coming to the Daniel Bible study. I can tell. Why was Daniel picked? Short answer, right person, right time, right place. And as a matter of fact, there were many like Daniel whom God used throughout the centuries. Joseph being one. Ezekiel being one. Visionaries that had been able to see things and impact the world that they were in because of what they were seeing and what God had shown them. But here is a slightly better answer. Take your Bibles, turn to Daniel chapter 1 verse 1. Daniel 1.1. 1, 1. In the third year of the reign of Jehoiakim, king of Judah, Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, came to Jerusalem and besieged it. By the way, sieges were dreadful, dreadful things. People ended up eating their own children to survive. And the Lord delivered Jehoiakim, king of Judah, into his hand, along with some of the articles of the temple of God. These he carried off, the temple of to the temple of his God in Babylonia, and he put them in the treasure house of his God. The king ordered Aphanaz, chief of the court officials, to bring in some of the Israelites from the royal family and nobility. Young men without physical defects, so 
Daniel was handsome and strong. Handsome, showing aptitude, every kind of learning, as well as informed, quick to understand, and qualified to serve in the king's palace. So you have Daniel, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. And all of these men were of the highest possible caliber. And they were right there placed in Nebuchadnezzar's palace. He was to teach them the language and the literature of the Babylonians. And the king assigned them a daily amount of food and so on. Let's just jump down to verse 6. Among these men of Judah were Daniel, Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah. That's their original Hebrew names. The chief official gave them a new, new names to Daniel, Belteshazzar, Hananiah, Shadrach, Mishael, Meshach, and Azariah, Abednego. But Daniel resolved not to defile himself with royal food and wine. He asked the chief official for permission not to defile himself in that way. I think that's probably why Daniel stood out, because Daniel, of all of them, refused to defile himself. And God used him. Question number five. By the way, that's a lesson for all of us. If you want to be used by God, refuse to defile yourself. Amen. Question number five. Was Mary a surrogate? Or was Jesus her biological son and therefore had her DNA also? Now I want you to know this is not a simple question. I have heard a lot of preaching on this over the years, and I've heard about as many people say that uh, the babe was placed in her complete and whole and required nothing from her except to carry it to term. And I've heard many people come along and say, well, no. The babe was not placed in their whole, but Mary shared her DNA with that baby. The argument against it, by the way, is would that mean then that the baby was born with original sin since that came down the line? And the answer appears to be no. It wouldn't mean that because it appears that original sin is passed down through the male side, not the female. I notice all the ladies smiling. A lot of men looking down. Cheer up. It gets better. So what do we do? Was, the, was he genetically part of Mary? And if that's the case, is she in fact Mary the mother of God? Well, of course not. God is Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. She was the father, uh, mother of Jesus, pardon me. But what does the Bible say concerning his genetic makeup? Take your Bibles, turn to Romans chapter 1, verse 1. Romans 1.1, 1, 1. Paul, a servant of Jesus Christ, called to be an apostle and set, for the gospel, and set apart for the gospel of God, the gospel he promised beforehand through his prophets in the Holy Scriptures, regarding his son, who is with, pardon me, who is, pardon me, who as to his human nature was a descendant of David, and who the spirit of holiness was declared with power to be the son of God by his resurrection from the dead, Jesus Christ, our Lord. Look at the line here. Who was a descendant of David. Now, if he does not share the biology, if he does not share the DNA, if he doesn't share the genetics of David, he cannot be considered to be a son of David. And the line is, or the, the, the statements in the Bible are very clear that he must come down the line of David. Did Mary's DNA pass to Jesus? Yes, absolutely. In Romans chapter 9, it says this. I speak the truth in Christ. I am not lying. My conscience confirms it in the Holy Spirit. I have great sorrow and uneasing, uneasy, un, unceasing anguish in my heart. For I could wish that I myself were cursed and cut off from Christ for the sake of my brothers, those of my own race, the people of Israel, 
Theirs is the adoption of sons. Theirs the divine glory, the covenants, the receiving of the law and the temple worship and the promises. Theirs are the patriarchs. And from them is traced the human ancestry of Christ. I think it's as clear as it can possibly be when you are writing it in first century uh, Greek and Hebrew, trying to make it very clear that he was a man just as we are. Matthew chapter 1, 1, a record of the genealogy of Jesus Christ, the son of David. Did he share Mary's DNA? Absolutely he did. But his father was quite another issue. Hebrews chapter 2, verse 17. For this reason, he had to be made like his brothers in every way, in order that he might become a merciful high priest in the service of God. There are passage after passage after passage after passage. It's so easy to find. It was an embarrassment of riches on this particular topic. Question number six. The NIV translation of Matthew 5.22 tells us that Jesus said, anyone who is angry with his brother or sister will be subject to judgment, while the King James Version translates it as anger without a cause. Which is the more accurate translation? Does anger become, when does anger become sinful? Anger becomes sinful when you allow yourself to sin because of anger. That's when it becomes sinful. The Bible says we could be angry and sin not. But here's the thing. Which of the two translations is correct? First of all, just a quick word about Bible translation. And we are running out of time very quickly. Your Bible is translated from three major manuscripts. The Masoretic Text, the Vaticanus, and the Sinaiticus. Of those texts, we have tens of thousands of partial copies, and sometimes entire copies of each book. We are absolutely sure that the newer translations are producing very high quality images of the original. Is the NIV the best? No, it's not. It just happens to be the one I use. But I always check against the King James. And if you want the truth, the most accurate of the modern translations, the most accurate, straightforward, plain, simple, English ones would be the NASB. It is the most accurate English translation. But I happen to use the 1984 version of the NIV. It's a good translation, not the best. And let me tell you something about translations. There simply are no perfect translations. So let's get to our question. NIV, but I tell you that anyone who is angry with his brother will be subject to judgment, King James. But I say unto you that whosoever is angry with his brother without cause shall be in danger of judgment, which is correct. Well, if you come back to your NIV and you look at the marginal notes, you'll see that they include some manuscripts angry with your brother without cause. In other words, the term without cause does appear in your NIV. It's just in the marginal notes. Amen. Amen. Question number seven. Without salvation, what will happen to a Jew when they die? In other words, do the Hebes get a pass? Do they get somehow you're Jewish? Come on in. Oi, we're having a party up here. 
Romans 9, chapter 2, verse 9. Romans chapter 2, verse 9. There will be trouble and distress for every human being who does evil, first to the Jew and then to the Gentile. But glory and honor and peace for everyone who does good, first to the Jew and then to the Gentile. For God does not show favoritism. How does anybody get in? All who sin apart from the law will also perish apart from the law. All who sin under the law will be judged by the law. How does anyone get saved? They must come to Christ. They must repent for their sins. They must ask for forgiveness. They must receive him as the promised Messiah. It doesn't matter whether you're Jew, Gentile, or anything in between. And by the way, there's nothing in between. The Bible has two classes, Jew and Gentile. Question number three. What is Jesus describing in Luke 23, 29? Take your Bibles, turn to Luke 23, verse 26. This will be our last question. The rest will answer in the next service. As they lead it, led him away, they seized Simon the Siren, who was on the way in from the country, and put the cross on him and made him carry it. And a large number of people followed him, including women who mourned and wailed for him. And Jesus turned to them and said, Daughters of Jerusalem, do not weep for me. Weep for yourselves and for your children. For the time will come when you'll say, Blessed is the barren woman, the, wo the wombs that have never born and the breasts that have never nursed. And then they'll say, Mountains, come and fall on us. And to the hills, cover us. For if men will do these things when the tree is green, what will happen when it's dry? If you really want to read a further description on this, you can read Deuteronomy 28, 52 to 61. I decided not to read it. It's too graphic. But you can read it. Deuteronomy 28, 52 uh, uh, to 61. What is happening here? He is describing what's going to happen in 70, ADs, 70 AD when Titus comes in and literally destroys Jerusalem. He's saying to those that are watching him go to the cross. He's been beaten. He's been flogged. He's had five separate illegal trials in one night. And finally, just a shadow of his self, if you will. Beaten, bruised, and bleeding. He turns to the women who are weeping as he comes past. This is, ladies, don't weep for me. Weep for yourselves, because what's coming next is going to be absolutely horrific. If they'll do that while I'm here, while the Messiah is here, while times are good, imagine what it's going to be like when I'm not here and times are not good. That's what's being explained in that passage. In the next service, we'll go on to the resurrection of our bodies. Do they have blood? Great question. And then we'll look into Corinthians and various other places in the Bible. I promise you, I will cover all the questions in the next service. Will you bow your heads with me? Precious Heavenly Father, in Jesus' name, I thank you for the joy of being able to study your word with these people. Lord, this is not so much a preaching service, but a teaching service, and we have gone through the questions that have been asked, that have been burning in the hearts and the minds of these people. Lord, this is their ask. And so I pray that I have delivered honest, true, and straightforward answers and that they will be encouraged in their faith. Let nobody, nobody be discouraged because of us, but let them be encouraged in their faith. In Jesus' name, amen.